chapter 4. First John chapter 4 this afternoon. I'm sure you're familiar with 1 John 4. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is, God is love. You know, in a certain yard on my daily walk, there's a rainbow flag that says love is love. It refers, of course, to the homosexual definition of it. We've redefined a whole bunch of English vocabulary. In fact, you and I cannot even trust the latest edition of the Merriam-Webster uh, Dictionary if you want an accurate definition of words. But here, there is one unmistakable, unchanging definition that is found in one primary person, and that's Jesus. God is love. And one primary place, verses 9 and 10, in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him here in his love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. One primary person defines God once and for all for us, and that's, uh, or defines love for us, and that's God. And one primary place, and that's Golgotha, the place of the skull, where our Savior Jesus hung and bled in agony, died for us, offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin. I want to share with you in just uh, these few minutes we have together, God is love. Just what we read there in that eighth verse. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Show us your love. Give us a glimpse of it. We've seen it, but we need to see it again and again. So, Lord, show us your love. Show us who you are. Thank you for the love of God. Thank you that you are love. We wouldn't know really what love is without you. And so I pray, the loving God that you are, that you would increase our understanding of who you are and your great love in Jesus' name. That is for his sake, his glory. Amen. Well, it's very clear in verses 9 and 10 that the place where we, first of all, get a glimpse that God is love is what is called the incarnation. That is God taking upon himself a human body, human form. That's God incarnate. See the word sent? It's in verse 9. It's also in verse 10. That word sent really says it all, that God sent his only begotten son, that God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word sent is really an expression of God's love for humanity. That God would send Jesus is the greatest expression of God's love for humanity. God chose to be a human being. Why? You say, that's great being a human being. Not always. Why would he do that? Simply because it's the way in which he could become one of us in order to perform that, uh, that work of a human substitute for us, that he might be able to wed us to himself for eternity. I don't know if you know anything about the, the uh, Greek mythology and the Greek gods. One of the things that uh, you often see being fought against in the New Testament is the idea of the Greeks and their gods. You know, the gods of the Greeks, they were too good to mingle with human beings. 
And so uh, the Greeks taught that creation came as a result of the gods having these lesser gods that did the dirty work for them and mingled with human beings and flesh and blood. Uh, and so you have these, they're really demons that uh, are credited with uh, creation. So in essence, the Greek gods tried to escape the human body because the human body to the Greek philosophy was it's evil. Matter is evil. And so they would have nothing to do with a human body. But Jesus took a human body so that he could know us and so that we could know him and we could be one with him. Isn't that amazing? Just the opposite of what was popular in that day. So we first get a glimpse that God is love in the incarnation. That God sent his son and that Jesus came taking upon himself a human body. Aren't you glad, as the writer of Hebrews says, that he did not take on the nature of angels, but rather he took upon himself flesh and blood like you and I, that he might be the perfect representation, the perfect human being, because it takes a perfect human being to atone for human sin. But there's a second thing in verse 10 that shows us God is love. First, the incarnation, but in verse 10, propitiation. See that big word there in the 10th verse? God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Don't let that big word throw you a curveball. The word propitiation has to do with satisfying. What it means is that God sent his son to satisfy all the right, righteous, just demands of God's law. And that, that Jesus is the propitiation, that's where God's love is perfectly expressed. And that took place, as I said, at Golgotha, where he was crucified. When you go to Golgotha, you really get a window into the very heart of God. And if any one of us, or anyone for that matter, ever wonders if God really loves me, you need to take a trip back to Golgotha. The place where you see the love of God for you as an individual, and not just the world, is when you look at Jesus hanging on that tree. As people have said, I asked God how much he loves me, and he stretched out his hands this much. There's a couple of things about the propitiation, that satisfying the, the demands of God's law that are to be thought of here. First of all, God's love at Golgotha was sacrificial. There is a connection between who God is, verse 8, he's love, and what God does. He exercises self-sacrificing love. That's what the cross is all about. He's giving himself so that sin can be removed to make a way for us to have a eternal relationship with him. And as I think about that, I I and, and as I meditated upon this, the thought came to me as I read Scripture and I understand the story and the plan of redemption that the thing that broke God's heart was driving Adam out of the Garden of Eden. Because that was the place where mankind had perfect fellowship with him, their maker, their God. And that broken relationship and that lost fellowship is what Golgotha is all about. It's the self-giving God that from that moment that he cast the human beings out of the garden, activated an eternal plan to rescue them and to restore human beings back into a permanent relationship and fellowship with himself. I believe the heart of God is broken over human 
over the human relationship that is severed with him. And so he's willing to go to these lengths. God is love, and so it is right, and it is thus expected that he would exercise self-giving love. And that's what Golgotha is about. But just jumping back a couple of chapters for a moment to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, and he is the propitiation for our sins. That's the same thing he says over again there in chapter 4, verse 10. He is the propitiation for our sins. Who? Jesus, Messiah. But look at, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. God is love. And his love is perhaps most vividly displayed at Golgotha in the propitiation that he makes there. It's a sacrificial thing, but it's also a universal thing. That is that when God loves, he loves the whole world. He doesn't leave anyone out. He loves Jew and Gentile. He loves all of humanity. We are selective as to who we love and who we don't love. God isn't. He loves the whole world, and no one is not on his list. In fact, God not only chooses, but he chooses the naughty to be on his list. He chooses the naughty because guess what? That's what we all are. There are no good ones. We're on his naughty list. And he chooses us deliberately because of that. When God looks around the world, all he ever sees is guilty ones. Romans 3 really brings that out. I don't have time to read it, but look it up sometime. Verses 10 to 23, where he tells us very clearly that there's none righteous. Not a single one. And yet, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that one and only unique son of his, that we, humanity, should not perish, but have our everlasting life. We used to have a, uh, uh, the Christian Camp Wilds produced several chorus books, and one of them had a wonderful song in it. I wish it was in our hymnal, but it's not. <clears throat> and the words to it go like this. Why stay in Olive's garden? Why spend the night in prayer? Why suffer such betrayal and anguish kneeling there? Why leave his mother crying? Why set Barabbas free? The spotless lamb of heaven given there for me. Why climb that dreadful mountain? Why suffer agony? Why give his blood a fountain spilled and broken, flowing free? When he walked the road to Calvary, he gave his life so willingly. He broke there, the rose of Sharon died for me. And then the chorus, it was for me he cried, for me he died, for me he shed his blood upon the tree. It was for me he came, for me his shame, for me, oh praise his name, it was for me. Let's pray.